Okay, in this lesson here, we are going to further our discussion on fluid management by taking a quick look at the subject of maintenance fluid, and more specifically, the calculation to determine a patient's needs. Now, this calculation has actually been requested many times, including from one of our Patreon members, so I wanted to do a quick review over the topic here. So let's get started and talk about our maintenance fluid. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. Again, my name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to try and give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by taking these complex critical care subjects and really breaking them down and making them easy to understand. I hope that I'm able to do just that for you guys, and if I am, then make sure you subscribe to this channel to continue to get great critical care content such as this video here. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications, that way you never miss out on a future lesson. And then when you're done with the lesson, make sure you head on over to icuadvantage.com or follow the link down in the lesson description to take the quiz on this lesson here and be entered into our weekly drawings for gift cards. All right, so before we get into talking about how to calculate our patient's maintenance fluids, I do want to stress that, especially in the critically ill, that we want to make sure that we are using fluids only when they are needed. Now, as I talked about in the previous lesson, which I'm going to link to up above here, we do have ways in which we can try and determine if our patient needs fluids. We truly only want to give them fluids if it's going to benefit an improvement in their cardiac output. Now, that said, especially for those in the ICU, adequate intake of fluids is often not going to be possible through normal means that we'd see with other patients. Now, oftentimes our patients are intubated and sedated, and clearly they're going to be unable to take their own fluids. Patients are also often NPO for various different reasons, including but not limited to planned surgeries. At the end of the day, our preferred method for both nutrition and hydration is via our enteral feeding. Unfortunately, though, this may not be a viable option for some patients. For those that don't have the duodenal tubes, they also face the same challenges with being NPO prior to surgery. There may also be contraindications to enteral feeding that could prevent this route for a patient as well. So with all of that said, there definitely are times that our patient will need to be given IV maintenance fluids. Our goal is to provide enough fluid to meet their metabolic demands as well as to ensure hemodynamic stability while also preventing dehydration and our goal here is to not overload them. An important takeaway is that we want to ensure that we're monitoring daily weights in our patients, assessing the necessity of these fluids on a daily basis. This is really not a set and forget type of therapy. In addition, we also have multiple drips that are going to be infused into our patients, which is also needed to be accounted for as they are providing fluid volume to them as well. So let's actually talk about the replacement of ongoing fluid loss for our patients, and really, there are a few different reasons that we're going to give our patients fluids. First, we have fluid resuscitation, and this is going to be that potentially aggressive fluid replacement that we see in cases of shock, uh, as well as hypovolemia and or dehydration. The goal here is going to be patient and organ rescue. We also would be giving fluids for replacement of losses. So here we're looking at replacing fluid losses seen in patients with burns, pancreatitis, GI losses such as emesis and diarrhea, surgical drains, fistulas, and even polyuria. Now for burns, we do use the Parkland formula to try and determine our fluid requirements, which I am going to do a separate lesson on this in the future when I do actually talk about burns. But in terms of losses, we're also going to need to correct free water deficits in our patient, and I am going to cover this specifically in another lesson in this series here. And then finally, we want to cover our patient's daily fluid needs. And this is really where our maintenance fluids come in. Our goals here in the replacement of losses is really the organ support by ensuring adequate perfusion. And then finally, a couple other different reasons that we would use IV fluids would be in the correction of electrolyte imbalances, as well as IV medication delivery. So let's go ahead and move on and talk about our maintenance fluid therapy. And so here, our main goal with maintenance fluids is to provide adequate hydration for our patients and thus organ perfusion. Again, it all kind of circles back around to why are we giving fluids? It's really about cardiac output and perfusion for our patients. 
And now again, if patients are unable to meet the needs themselves and we're unable to meet those needs with enteral feeding, then this is when we want to consider the use of IV fluids. Once our patient is hemodynamically stable and able to satisfy their fluid needs enterally, then we really want to discontinue the maintenance IV fluids at this point. So when it comes to our regimen for our IV fluids, we're typically wanting to start with isotonic crystalloids that do have dextrose. So here, think your D5NS or your D5LR. And if you haven't watched it already or you do just want a refresher on the different types of IV fluids, I am going to link to that lesson here up above. But our goal here with using the dextrose solutions is we really want to try to prevent the starvation ketosis. Now, once we have some nutritional support on board for our patients, then we actually want to switch them to regular fluids without dextrose. So here, these would be our, again, our isotonic crystalloids and examples would be normal saline or lactated ringers. Now, as I mentioned, we want to ensure that we are monitoring and adjusting rates up and down based on the patient's need. For example, fever and tachypnea may lead to them needing more fluids, and then signs of overload may lead us to using less fluids. We also often consider adding potassium to our maintenance fluids, although if they are deficient, we do want to replace those separately, which again is going to be another separate lesson that I do cover in this series. And then finally, remember that IV fluids, even with dextrose, are not nutrition, and we need to have a plan in place for nutrition for our patients as soon as possible. All right, so with that said, let's go ahead and get in and talk about a couple different calculations that we have for trying to determine our patient's fluid needs. And the first of these is actually going to be what's referred to as the 421 rule. Now, this is a rule that was developed to help to calculate the fluid needs of both adults and children. The calculation gives us an hourly fluid rate. Now, this is important to remember because the other one that I'm going to talk about is actually going to be a daily fluid. So for the first 10 kilograms of a patient's body weight, we're going to give them 4 milliliters per kilogram per hour. Then for the next 10 kilograms, we're going to give them 2 milliliters per kilogram per hour. And then for everything over 20 kilograms, we're going to give them 1 milliliter per kilogram per hour. So let's roll through a couple of examples real quick. So first, we're going to take a look at a 5 kilogram patient. So for here, we're only going to be in the first part of this calculation, so we're going to take their 5 kilograms of body weight, multiply that by 4 milliliters per kilogram per hour, and this is going to give us 20 milliliters per hour. And this would be the rate that their maintenance fluid requirement needs. Now, if we look at a 15 kilogram patient, first we're going to take the first 10 kilograms, and we're going to multiply that by 4 milliliters per kilogram per hour, giving us 40 milliliters per hour. So for the next 5 kilograms, we're actually going to move to the second part of this calculation. So we're going to take the 5 kilograms of body weight times 2 mLs per kilogram per hour, giving us a total of 10 mLs per hour. We add these two together, and we get a grand total of 50 mLs per hour, again, to set our maintenance fluid. And then finally, let's take a look at a 75 kilogram patient. So here, we're actually going to use all three parts of the calculation. So for the first 10 kilograms, we already did that calculation. We know that it's 40 mLs an hour. For the next 10 kilograms, we're going to take that 10 times 2 milliliters per kilogram per hour, giving us a total of 20 mLs per hour. And then for the remaining 55 kilograms, so this would be the patient's weight 75 minus the 20 kilograms that we've already used, we're going to take 55 kilograms times 1 mL per kilogram per hour, giving us a total of 55 mLs per hour. So now we add these all together, so 40 plus 20 plus 55, and this gives us a grand total of 115 milliliters per hour. Now there is a quicker calculation if you're only going to be using this in adults, and here we're simply going to take 40 plus the patient's weight in kilograms, which will give us the hourly rate. So just to prove that this works, again, if we take our 75 kilogram patient, we can do 40 plus 75, which equals 115, which if you remember is the total that we just calculated out. The math works and it just makes it a little bit easier to calculate out the requirements for adults. All right, so that was our 421 rule. Now let's actually talk about a different rule, something referred to as the 150-20 rule. Now again, this is another calculation, but typically this one's going to be used for adults. This one, though, is actually going to give us a daily fluid requirement. So we would need to take this number, divide it by 24 to get our hourly rate. Now, this one, though, works very similar to the 421 rule. 
So for the first 10 kilograms, we're going to give them 100 mLs per kilogram per day. For the next 10 kilograms, we're going to give them 50 mLs per kilogram per day. And then after 20 kilograms, we're going to give them 20 mLs per kilogram per day. And we can see that this is close to the 421 rule if we really compare the calculations. So we know that there's 24 hours in a day, but if we use 25 as an easy number, this is what we get. The 421 rule, we have 4 mLs per kilogram per hour. Let's times that by 25, which equals 100. For the next level of the 421, we have 2 milliliters per kilogram per hour. Again, times that by 25, and you get 50. And then finally, for the third level, we have 1 mL per kilogram per hour. Multiply that by 25. Here we get 25, but we can see that's pretty close to 20. And here you can see we pretty much have the 150-20. So really, these calculations are going to be quite similar. And again, let's take a 75 kilogram patient as an example and see how they compare. So here for the first 10 kilograms, we're going to multiply that by 100 mLs per kilogram per day, which gives us 1,000 milliliters per day. For the next 10 kilograms, we're going to do that multiplied by 50 mLs per kilogram per day, which gives us 500 mLs per day. And then for the remaining 55 kilograms, we're going to multiply that by 20 mLs per kilogram per day, giving us another 1,100 milliliters per day. If we add these together, we get a grand total of 2,700 milliliters per day. Or if we divide that by 24, we get 112.5 mLs per hour. So you can see it's pretty close to the 421 calculation where we got 115 mLs per hour. So those are really the two primary different calculations that we use to try and determine what our patient's fluid maintenance requirements might be. But there are a couple things that we do want to keep in mind. Now again, these are merely baseline calculations. If your patient is getting fluids for IV medications, you want to subtract that from the calculated need. The total that we give, both from IV medications as well as just IV maintenance fluid, should equal what your calculation is. As I mentioned earlier, we need to monitor these patients frequently and make adjustments as needed, so we do want to ensure that we have daily weights. This calculation does not account for other losses that were mentioned, so we need to make those up in addition, potentially. For obese patients or those that are weighing over 90 or 100 kilograms, we probably want to use the patient's ideal body weight for their height instead of what their actual body weight is. Again, fat has different fluid requirements than the rest of the body, so we don't want to be adding in extra fluids for something that really doesn't need it. And then finally, remember that fluids have consequences, and so we need to be as purposeful with their use as any other medication that we give our patient in the ICU. All right, so that was our review, quick review of maintenance fluids as well as the calculations to try and determine what your patient needs. Again, I hope that you guys really enjoyed this lesson. If you did, please leave me a like down below. It really goes a long way to help support this channel in the eyes of the YouTube algorithm. Also, leave me a comment down below and let me know what you thought of the lesson or any questions that you might have. I love reading your guys' comments and answering your questions. If you haven't subscribed already, make sure you do, as well as share this lesson with anybody else you think might find it useful. A special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you guys are willing to provide for this channel is greatly appreciated and is really going to allow me to continue to do bigger and better things with this channel. For the rest of you guys, if you'd be interested in seeing some of the additional perks that you get for doing just that, you can join the YouTube membership down below or head on over to the Patreon page and check out some of those perks. You can also support this channel by following some of the links down in the lesson description, as well as checking out some of the awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you stay tuned for the next lesson in this series. Otherwise, check out a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.